Well, Jim, let's uh, close out the show with classic wrestling talk. I have an email here. Let me read this. This is from Tim Dalton, proud Smoky Mountain Wrestling Fan Week veteran, Buffalo, New York. I remember Tim. Tim, yes. Very nice guy. Very, very nice guy. One of the Dalton gang. I'm behind in listening to episodes, but I heard your recent guest the program from Buffalo 1968. You were wondering why Bobby Bruns was promoting shows in a territory historically run by Pedro Martinez. I can give you a definitive answer. After Ilio de Paulo retired in 1965, wrestling here in Buffalo went into the crapper. There were only about 20 shows in total between 1966 and 1967. Here's a note from the old Steel Belt Wrestling website regarding 1968. Following the slow times in 1967, wrestling in 1968 was sporadic and passed through a couple different promoters. Bobby Bruns promoted the annual Parade of Champions, which uncharacteristically was held in April. The event featured an NWA title defense by Gene Kaniski, although WWF champion Bruno Sammartino had appeared as title holder about 18 months before. Late in the year, Bruns made an attempt to reinvigorate wrestling in Buffalo in a tried-and-true fashion. He brought back the area's most infamous tag team, Doc and Mike Gallagher, for several matches against the dream pairing of Argentina Rocca and Johnny Powers. The Gallaghers had ended their long pairing in 1966 as Mike went into business in North Carolina and Doc was working at a health club in Atlanta. Reliance on the Gallaghers seemed to spark interest for a couple of cards, but the territory was again flat by the end of the year in which a final show was canceled. Now back to Tim here. It seems things went back to normal, in quotes, later in 1969, with Powers and the Love Brothers headlining shows, leading to the formation of the NWF in 1970. So there's a little historical information, a backstory behind Bobby Bruns and Buffalo. Well, and uh, now, now I think he said Elio DiPaolo retired from the ring in what, he said 65 or 66? 65. But Pedro Martinez predated that, I thought, as far as promoting Buffalo. Did he leave and then come back? Well, um, I mean, well, it says the NWF formed out of this with Bobby Bruns running. It was after that that the NWF formed. Of course, the NWF, right. everyone thinks of Johnny Powers and Pedro Martinez. So I, w I guess uh, basically uh, Martinez was not involved in the early '60s, and it was, and Elio DePaulo had more pull in the office than what we might have imagined. How do you think you would have seen that if you were a longtime promoter in, let's say, upstate New York or Ohio, just the general area, and you have the option? You have a town that was a pretty good wrestling town. It's gone dormant. Biggest star is no longer wrestling. May not even be involved with the promotion trying to bring back old stars to get people in. Who knows if any new stars are getting them interested, but they're having problems drawing. What stops a town from becoming dormant? What causes a promoter to go in there and try again, and how scary a proposition is that? Well, any time in the territory days that a, a town or towns linked together in the same general area stopped running for whatever reason, became dark, Everybody wanted to open them up, but you, you know, you needed to be able to get television. You also needed to be access to a crew of guys. And it sounds like instead of trying to affiliate himself necessarily full fledged with the WWWF or even uh, uh, the territory, if I'm doing my geography right in my head, the Sheik's Detroit territory, Detroit and Ohio, and that you know, part would be somewhat adjacent where guys could be sent, but he didn't try to do that. He tried to bring in some of his old friends, the Gallaghers. They were, you know, one of the top tag teams in the history of that area. But it, it seems like from, because a lot of times what guys would do in those days is they would call in favors from old friends and maybe Bobby Bruns being from, the Midwest, from the St. Louis Central States area, he'd probably have more friends, either Sam Muchnick himself or Kaniski, who's the NWA champion. 
you know, so it looks like he was trying to piece it together and just call in favors. And we don't know what the TV situation was. Was it good TV or was it really any TV? Or was it consistent television? When you when you run infrequent shows when you're trying to open up a territory, that's not good because you don't get the wrestling fans in the habit of Monday night at the Mid-South Coliseum or Friday night in the Sam Houston Coliseum or whatever the case. And as Christine Jarrett used to say, wrestling fans are creatures of habit. So the fact that they were running infrequent shows, he was trying to do it, but he probably wasn't well financed. And, you know, sometimes when you run and you cancel and then you set up another date, people don't trust it. There was an element of nostalgia to the names on the card, but not necessarily a cohesiveness of a a territory running regular events and ongoing rivalries and programs between the talent. So, you know, it probably just didn't work. <clears throat> and I mean, I've seen, you know, Jerry Jarrett tried to go into Cincinnati in 1980. But unfortunately, he had just landed the television deal when Lawler broke his leg. And business in 1980 and everywhere in the territory was yeah, for a lot of the year because there was no Lawler and they tried to open up a new town. I went to the first show at the Cincinnati Gardens that seated about 11,000 and there wasn't even 1,100. It was fucking bad because that was a whole new group of, of talent they'd never seen before. It was a show that they weren't seeing the top name to begin with and they had been used to a whole nother style and Jared wasn't going to rent a 10,000 seat building on a regular basis to to lose money to the point where if he did get him in the habit and Lawler had come back and a blah, 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 because the next year Memphis is drawing 8,000 people a week when Lawler came back, but it wouldn't have done that in Cincinnati because they didn't know at that time who he was to be overjoyed he was back. So it depends on your timing. It depends on your television. It depends on the access to the talent you've got as to whether you can open up a dark town and make a go of it. And we, we've told the story where Jared opened up Louisville. It had been dark for almost five years, but he had a TV. He was the booker. He had a building he could afford, and they came. And he made nothing but money in Louisville for 20-something years. but. He couldn't do it in Cincinnati because the timing wasn't right and the TV wasn't strong enough and the building was too big. And some of that could have come into play in Buffalo as well. It just, you know, you've seen throughout history promoters that are successful in one particular area try to annex another area or go to another place and it, it doesn't work at all. It's not because they couldn't do it. Or even that they had bad talent, but sometimes it's the TV, sometimes it's the building, or sometimes it's just how burnt the town was that caused it to go dark to begin with. And they might remember that, oh, that fucking wrestling. We don't want to see any more of that shit. Or it could be, oh, God, wrestling, we haven't had that in ages. It just depends. <laughs> 